welcome to lecture seven. In this lecture, we'll talk about all the ways that the world of Bitcoin and the technology touches the world of people. We'll talk about the community. We'll talk about politics within Bitcoin and the way that Bitcoin interacts with politics. And we'll talk about law enforcement and regulation issues. In lecture 7.1, we'll talk about consensus in Bitcoin, the way that the operation of Bitcoin relies on the formation of consensus among people. Now, there are really three kinds of consensus that have to operate for Bitcoin to be successful. The first kind is a consensus about the rules. This is a consensus about things like, what is it that makes a transaction valid? How can you tell a valid transaction from an invalid one? Second, what makes a block in the blockchain valid? Which block should be accepted and which block should be rejected? Third, how the nodes in the P2P network should behave how they should inter interact with each other and what kind of protocol they should use to discuss with each other, and more generally, all the protocols and data formats that are involved in making Bitcoin work. You need to have a consensus about these things so that all the different participants in the system can talk to each other and agree on what's happening. And so the first form of consensus that goes into Bitcoin is just a consensus about what these rules should be in order for the system to go forward. The second form of consensus in Bitcoin is consensus about the history. That is a consensus about what's in the blockchain and what's not in the blockchain. And therefore a consensus about which transactions have occurred. Uh, and once you have a consensus about which transactions have occurred, what follows from that is of course a consensus about which coins, which unspent outputs exist and who owns them. Uh, and so this consensus obviously uh, flows from the processes that we've talked about in earlier lectures by which the blockchain is built and by which uh, nodes come to consensus, the processes that we hope push Bitcoin toward a consensus about the contents of the blockchain. So that consensus about what's in the blockchain and therefore what the history is, is the second important form of consensus that Bitcoin relies on. The third form of consensus that Bitcoin relies on is just the consensus that coins are valuable. That is the general agreement that Bitcoins are valuable, that Bitcoins are a good thing to have, and in particular, the consensus that if somebody gives you a Bitcoin today, that tomorrow you'll be able to redeem or trade that for something that is of value. Any currency needs this, whether it's a, a fiat currency like the dollar or a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, you need a consensus that the thing has value. That is, you need people to generally accept that it's exchangeable for something of value now and in the future. Uh, and, and, and so that's the third kind of thing that Bitcoin needs. Um, now this, this form of consensus, unlike the others, uh, can be viewed as a little bit circular. In other words, the, my belief that the Bitcoins I'm receiving today are of value depends on my expectation that tomorrow other people will believe the same thing. It, it, um, so consensus on value relies on believing that consensus on value will continue. And this is sometimes called the Tinkerbell effect by analogy to Peter Pan, where it's said that Tinkerbell exists because you believe in her. Uh, the same thing is kind of true here, that the consensus that Bitcoins have value exists because of the consensus that Bitcoins have value. So circular or not, it's a thing that seems to exist and it's important for Bitcoin to operate. Now what's important about all three forms of consensus is the way that they're intertwined with each other. Uh, and this diagram shows a little bit about what I mean when I say that. First of all, the consensus about the rules and the consensus about history go together. Uh, because it's the rules that determine which kinds of transactions can go into a block and which kinds of blocks can come into existence. If you agree on the rules, that is which blocks are valid, then it's possible to build a consensus about the blockchain and about history. Whereas without a consensus about the rules, then people are going to disagree about what's in the history and you won't be able to come to consensus in that way. So consensus about rules and consensus about history are tied together. In a similar way, consensus about history and a consensus that coins are valuable is, are, are, are also tied together. Consensus about history means that we agree on who owns which coins and agreeing on who owns which coins is a, necessary, uh, is a necessary prerequisite for believing that the coins have value. Because if, if there's not a consensus that I own a particular coin, then I'm not going to have any expectation that people will accept that coin for, from me in payment in the future. So consensus about history is a prerequisite for consensus that coins are valuable. But in the same way, 
the consensus that coins are valuable is needed to make the consensus about history work. Uh, and we heard about this in the earlier lecture when we talked about the incentive arguments, the ways in which the block reward that is built into the mining process creates an incentive for people to follow the, the expectations about mining. So the consensus that coins are valuable at what is what creates the incentives that allows us to get to a consensus about history. And so we have all three forms of consensus here which are tied together um, such that if any one of them failed, then the other ones would fall apart as well. And in a sense, the genius of Bitcoin, the genius in Bitcoin's original design, uh, was in recognizing that it would be very difficult to get any one of these forms of consensus by itself. Consensus about the rules in a worldwide decentralized environment where there's no strong notion of identity, that's just not the kind of thing that's likely to, to happen. Consensus about a history, similarly, that is a very difficult distributed consensus data structure problem, which is not likely to be solvable on its own. And a consensus that some kind of cryptocurrency has value was also a very difficult thing to put together. What the designer of Bitcoin and what the continued operation of Bitcoin shows is that even if you can't build any one of these forms of consensus by itself, you can somehow stand up all three of them together and get them to operate in an interdependent way. Uh, and so when we talk about how things operate within the Bitcoin community, uh, we have to bear in mind that Bitcoin relies on consensus, it relies on agreement by the participants, and that that consensus is a fragile and interdependent thing. In section 7.2, uh, we'll talk about the Bitcoin core software. This is a piece of open source software which is a focal point for discussion of and debate about Bitcoin's rules. The Bitcoin Core software is a body of open source software. It's licensed under the MIT license, which is a very permissive open source license. It allows the software to be used for almost any purpose, uh, as long as the source is attributed and the license, the MIT license is not stripped out. Uh, the Bitcoin Core software comprises the most widely used Bitcoin software. And even those who don't use it uh, tend to look to it uh, to define what the rules are. That is, people who are building alternate Bitcoin software typically try to mimic the, uh, the, the rule-defining parts of the, uh, of the Bitcoin Core software. That is, they look at the parts that check uh, which transactions are valid, they look at the parts that check which blocks are valid, and they try to behave in the same way as the core software. So this is the focal point for talking about what the rules are. In fact, the Bitcoin Core defines the de facto rulebook of Bitcoin. Uh, if you want to know what's valid in Bitcoin, if you want to know what the rules are, this is the place to look. This or explanations of it. Another related uh, piece of machinery is Bitcoin improvement protocols or, or, or BIPs. Um, these are a formal pr proposals for, cha for a change to Bitcoin. Um, and typically an improvement proposal will include a technical specification for a proposed change as well as a rationale for it. So if you have an idea about how to improve Bitcoin by making some technical change, uh, you're encouraged to write up one of these documents, you're encouraged to publish it as part of the Bitcoin Improvement Proposal series, and that will then kick off a discussion within the community about what to do. They're published in a numbered series. Each one has a champion, that is sort of an author whose job it is to evangelize in favor of it, to coordinate discussion, and to try to build a consensus within the community in favor of going forward with or implementing a particular proposal. Uh, now what I've talked about so far are uh, proposals to, to change the, uh, the technology. There are also some um, BIPs that are purely informational, just to tell people about uh, things that they might not otherwise know, or that are process oriented, that talk about how things should be decided within the Bitcoin community. But nevertheless, if you have an idea about how to Im improve Bitcoin, typically you would make a Bitcoin improvement proposal, and that would be the process for discussion going forward of proposed rule changes. And so we have a rule book, and we have a process for proposing, specifying, and talking about rule changes. Uh, now the other group we need to talk about with respect to the Bitcoin Core software are the core developers. Uh, we have uh, these six people, uh, maybe arguably five, Satoshi Nakamoto, who I'll talk about a little bit later, is not currently active. Um, but the other five are uh, currently involved as core developers of the Bitcoin Core software. So these are the people who are leading the, the effort to continue development on the Bitcoin Core. 
uh, and who are in charge of which code gets pushed into uh, new versions of the Bitcoin core. So how powerful are these people? Well, on the one hand, they're very powerful in one sense. In another sense, they're not all that powerful at all. Uh, on the one hand, you could argue that they're powerful because the rule changes, that is the changes to the code that get shipped in the Bitcoin core will be followed by default. These are the people who actually hold the pen that, writes, that can write things into the de facto rule book of Bitcoin. On the other hand, because it's open source software and anybody can copy it and modify it, um, anybody can fork the software at any time. And so if the lead developers start behaving in a way that the community uh, doesn't like, strongly rejects, the community can go a different direction. So one way of thinking about this is to say that the lead developers are leading the parade. So they're out in front of the parade marching and the parade will generally follow them when they turn a corner. Uh, but, if, but, if, but if they try to lead the parade in a direction that's disastrous, well then the parade members, the uh, marching behind them, might decide to go in a different direction. They can urge uh, people on, and as long as they seem to be behaving reasonably, the group will probably follow them. But they don't have formal power to force people to, uh, to follow them uh, if they take the system in a technical direction that the community doesn't like. So uh, it's worth, in this respect, thinking about what you as a user of a system can do if you don't like uh, the way the rules are going or the way it's being run. And to, to compare a centralized currency, like either a fiat currency or a currency that's issued by a central entity, against something like Bitcoin. So in a centralized currency, if you don't like what's going on, you have the right to exit. You can leave the currency, which means that you can stop using it. You can sell any currency you hold or try to sell it, uh, and then you can just stop using it. Just like any business that you do business with, almost any business, you have the ability to just stop dealing with them if you don't like what they're doing. On the other hand, if it's a currency and you've got a lot of business, you've got a lot of assets tied up in it, it might be expensive or difficult to actually exit. But with a centralized currency, that's really your only option. With Bitcoin, because it operates in an open source way, you have the right to fork the rules. That means you and perhaps some of your friends or colleagues can decide that you'd rather live under a different rule set. And you can fork the rules and go a different direction from where the lead developers have gone. The right to fork like this is more empowering for users than the right to exit. You can exit if you want, but you have the right to fork and that actually gives you more power. And therefore, the community has more power in a system like Bitcoin, which is open source, than it would have with a purely centralized system. So although the lead developers might look like a centralized entity controlling everything, in fact, they don't have the power that a purely centralized manager or software owner would have. Now, let's look a little bit more at what happens if there's a fork in the rules. And I'm talking here, in a previous lecture, uh, we talked about the distinction between a hard fork and a soft fork. I'm talking about a hard fork here. So what happens is the following. So here we have the blockchain, which is coming along, building up the history. And at some point, there will be a fork in the blockchain if there's a disagreement about the rules. And you get two branches. You get one branch, of, let's say this one up here, which is valid under rule set A, but invalid under rule set B. And conversely, you have another branch down here, which is valid under rule set B and invalid under rule set A. Uh, if, there's, if there's a hard fork as to what the rules should be, uh, then there will be some transactions that are valid on each side and not the other, and this will eventually happen. And once these branches go apart, they can't come back together because this branch is illegal under the B rules, this branch is illegal under the A rules. They're permanently separate. So if, if the currency that we had over here on the left we can think of as being Bitcoin, the big happy Bitcoin that everyone agreed on, uh, after the fork, it's as if there are two new currencies, which you can think of as being A coin, corresponding to rule set A, and we'll call this one down here B coin, corresponding to rule set B. Uh, and it's as if at this moment where there was a fork, uh, everyone who owned one Bitcoin at the moment of the fork will receive one A coin and one B coin at that time. And from that time on, A coins and B coins will operate separately, as if they were separate currencies. Um, and, uh, and they might operate independently. The A group and the B group might evolve their rules different, in different ways, and certainly their blockchains will continue to grow in ways that are probably inconsistent across the two coins. So when this happens, we might say that the currency forked. Uh, 
that it's not just the software or the rules that forked or the software implementing the rules that forked. It's the currency itself that forked. And that's an interesting thing that can happen in a system like Bitcoin that couldn't happen in a traditional currency where the option of forking is not available to users. Okay, so what happens if a fork like this goes on? What, act, what do people actually do? How do they respond? Well, after a hard fork like this, there are really two cases. The first case is where the fork was really not intended as a disagreement about the rules, but the fork was designed as a way of starting an altcoin, that is, of starting a new kind of cryptocurrency with different rules. And if somebody just wanted to start their own currency and they found it convenient to start with a rule set that was very close to Bitcoin's, they found it convenient maybe even to start with Bitcoin's blockchain and to fork off as I, as I illustrated on the previous uh, slide, then that's not really a problem. The altcoin goes its separate way. The branches coexist peacefully and uh, some people prefer to use Bitcoin, some prefer to use the altcoin. The interesting case is what happens if the fork actually reflected a fight between two groups about what the future of Bitcoin should be. If that's the case, then the two branches are rivals. And the branches will fight for market share. We, after, the, after the fork, there's an A coin and there's a B coin. And each branch will try to get more merchants to accept it. Each branch will try to get more people to buy it. Um, the branches will fight for market share. They'll, the branches will fight to be seen, to be perceived as being the real Bitcoin. Probably each branch says, claims to be the real Bitcoin. And there's a public relations fight between them which goes along with the fight for market share. Each one wants to be seen as the real thing and the other one to be seen as the weird splinter group. Probably, eventually one branch will win and the other one will melt away. Uh, these sorts of competitions tend to tip in one direction. Once one of the two gets seen as more legitimate, gets seen as having a bigger market share, gets perceived more broadly as being the real one, the other one becomes kind of a niche currency and eventually will fall away. So uh, this is the likely future if you had a fork that reflected a fight over the future of Bitcoin. And what this amounts to is a kind of rebellion within the Bitcoin community where a subgroup decides to break off and say, we think we have a better idea about how this should be run. And you have a competition between the new and the old, which eventually one of them probably wins and becomes seen as the de facto new rule set and the de facto new uh, governance structure. In section 7.3, we'll talk about who are the stakeholders in Bitcoin. Really the question is who's in charge. We've talked about how Bitcoin relies on consensus and about uh, how the rule book of Bitcoin is written in practice. We've talked about the possibility of a fork or a fight about what the rules should be. Uh, so now I want to come to the question of uh, who actually has the power to determine who might win a fight like that. Okay, so who is the power? Well, suppose there's a negotiation about rule setting. There's a discussion within the community. There's a disagreement about which rule set should be used. Uh, who actually controls the outcome? Uh, now, if you think about it, as with any negotiation, one of the most important factors in, in understanding who has an advantage in the negotiation um, is to look at what happens if the negotiation fails and it comes down to a fight. And generally speaking, whoever has the best alternative to a negotiated agreement uh, is going to have the advantage in a negotiation. In other words, whoever is likely to win a fight is likely to win the negotiation. It's the uh, long-standing rule that on the playground, the biggest, strongest person uh, is likely to get their way, even if no blows are exchanged. So let's talk about who actually has the power and who would be able to win if there were uh, a, a fight involving a fork in the rules and a struggle for power over what the future of Bitcoin would be. So uh, we can make a bunch of claims on behalf of a bunch of different stakeholders. The first claim is that the Bitcoin core developers have the power. Whoever it is that develops the core software, uh, they have the power. They write the rule book. They literally have their fingers on the keyboard um, and have the ability to change the code that gets shipped. Since they write the rule book, since almost everybody does use their code and does follow their rules in practice, you could argue that they have the power because they can actually put a change out there that other people would at least by default accept. So the first stakeholder is the developers. A second claim though that we might make is that it's the miners who have the power. Why? Because miners are the ones who write the history. The miners are the ones who make the blocks that record the transactions that have happened. And so if the miners decide to follow a certain set of rules, 
then arguably everybody else has to follow it. Uh, we talked in previous lectures about what happens if you have a majority of miners. Certainly if there's a disagreement among the miners, and let's say 80% of them want one rule set, 20% want the other, well the 80% group is going to be able to build a bigger, more impressive blockchain. Um, and so they have some ability to push, push the rules in a particular direction. Now how much power they have depends maybe on whether the fork is a hard fork or a soft fork. This can get a little bit technical into the details of the dynamics of Bitcoin. But bottom line is, miners have some amount of power because they get to write the history. And the history is going to be consistent with whatever consensus rules the miners end up following in the long run. So the second claim is that the miners have the power. You might also claim, though, that investors have the power. Why? Because investors are the ones who buy a lot and hold a lot of the Bitcoins. And so it's the investors who decide whether Bitcoin has any value. If the miners control the consensus about the history, and the developers control the consensus about the rules, it's the investors who control the consensus that Bitcoin will have value. Uh, or at least that's the way the argument goes. So in the case of a hard fork, the investors, if they all or mostly decide to put their money on one branch, on the A coin or the B coin, then uh, that one will have a lot of perceived legitimacy. And so the investors have a lot of power to decide which way things go if there is a fork. On the other hand, we could claim that merchants and their customers are the ones who have the power. Why? Because merchants and customers are the ones who generate the primary demand for Bitcoin. Yes, investors provide some of the demand that supports the price of the currency, but the primary demand that drives the price of the currency, as we saw in lecture four, is, uh, is driven by a desire to mediate transactions, to use Bitcoin as, as a transaction technology. And because merchants and their customers drive that demand, they're the ones who drive the long-term price of Bitcoin. Or so this argument goes. Investors, according to this argument, are just guessing where the primary demand will be in the future. So investors are guessing where the merchants and customers will go in the future. And therefore, it's the merchants and their customers who really have the power. On the other hand, we could argue that no, it's the payment services that have the power. They're the ones that really handle transactions. A lot of merchants don't care which currency they follow. They simply want to use a payment service which will give them dollars and, and ease of use and handle all of the risk. And so to the extent that merchants and customers have power and that those people rely on the payment services to actually handle transactions, well then maybe it's the payment services that have the power because they drive primary demand and merchants, customers, and investors will follow them. Okay, now I've argued for a bunch of different parties all of whom, I've argued, should have the power. And there's some merit to all of those arguments. But the fact is, all of those entities have some power. In order to succeed, remember, a coin needs all these forms of consensus. Um, it needs a stable rule book written by developers. It needs investment. It needs mining power. And it needs participation by merchants and customers um, and the payment services that support them. So all of these parties have some power in controlling the outcome of a fight about the future of Bitcoin. And there's no one that we can point to as being the definite winner. It's a big, ugly, messy, consensus-building um, exercise. There's one more player that I want to talk about when I talk about governance of Bitcoin, and that's the Bitcoin Foundation. The Bitcoin Foundation was founded in 2012. Uh, and it really does two main things. First of all, it pays the core developers, or at least some of the core developers, it pays them a salary out of the foundation's assets so that they can work full time on, on continuing to develop the software. The other thing that the Bitcoin Foundation does is it talks to government, especially the US government, as the voice of Bitcoin. Uh, people in the Bitcoin community uh, said it, that we have a problem, that there's no one to talk to government on our behalf, and so our case is not being made, our arguments are not being heard in government. We need to have an entity that will do that. And the Bitcoin Foundation is one of the things that was set up to do that. And so that's the other function that the Bitcoin Foundation was set up to do. Now the Bitcoin Foundation is not in charge of Bitcoin any more than any of these other parties are. It has membership from some members of the community, not from other members of the community. And its success ultimately, like everything else in this kind of open source consensus-based ecosystem, will be driven by how much support it can attract and retain from the community over time. And it's worth discussing the points of controversy that have happened with respect to the Bitcoin Foundation. 
Um, there have been controversies over the membership in the board where some members of the Bitcoin Foundation board have gotten into trouble. Um, they've gotten into criminal trouble or they've gotten into financial trouble and, uh, and the foundation has had to struggle with dealing with uh, what to do about members of the board that are become, uh, become liabilities and have to be replaced on short notice. Uh, there's been some controversy from those people who believe that Bitcoin should operate outside of and apart from uh, traditional national governments, that Bitcoin shouldn't be in the position of negotiating with the government. Bitcoin should be what it is, be independent of government and uh, simply operate across borders, not having to explain or justify itself to government at all. People who believe in that point of view don't like the fact that there are people in suits who uh, hand out business cards saying Bitcoin on them and talk to government as the voice of Bitcoin. Um, and finally, there are people who, there have been controversies over the Bitcoin Foundation and the question of who put these people in charge. There are members of the community who feel that the foundation and the people who set up the foundation uh, aren't really uh, true representatives of the community and that they are anointing themselves as leaders of something that they have no right to put themselves in charge of. So although the Bitcoin Foundation is prominent, there are still some questions about what its role is going to be in the long run. Uh, I think it's fair to uh, conclude that the Bitcoin Foundation in its dealings with government has done a fair amount to smooth the road for understanding of an acceptance of Bitcoin, at least uh, within the US government. Uh, but still, the foundation continues to be a somewhat controversial organization and one that's going to be the topic of debate going forward. So when we come down to the question of who's really in charge of Bitcoin, who's in control, the answer is, in one way, nobody that there is no one entity, no one group that's definitively in control. Uh, in another sense, the answer is everybody because it's really the existence of this consensus about how the system will operate, the three interlocking forms of consensus on rules, on history, and on value uh, that really is what governs Bitcoin. And any group, any rule set, any structure that can retain that consensus uh, will, in a re very real sense, be in charge of Bitcoin. In lecture 7.4, we'll talk about the roots of Bitcoin, how it got started, what were the precursors to it, and we'll talk about the mysterious founder of Bitcoin. There were really two precursors to Bitcoin that, uh, that are worth talking about. First, Bitcoin arose out of the cypherpunk movement. This was a movement that uh, brought together two uh, trends or arguments. Um, first was uh, libertarianism, and particularly the idea that society would be better off with either no government or with a very minimal government, with government enforcing only the minimum rule set necessary to allow people to coexist at all. So together with that strong libertarian notion, or perhaps even anarchist notion, uh, we had the idea of strong cryptography and public key cryptography, which started in the late 1970s. These two I ideas came together in the cypherpunk movement, and this was a group of people who believed that with strong online privacy and strong cryptography, you could re-architect the way that people interacted with each other into a world in which people could protect themselves and their interests more effectively uh, and could do so with much less activity, um, action, or um, as they would say, interference from government. So that was the cypherpunk movement. Um, one of the challenges on the cypherpunk movement was how you were going to deal with money in a future cypherpunk world where people were interacting over the net and interacting via strong technical and cryptographic measures. Uh, and so uh, a bunch of research came along, uh, led especially by uh, early digital cash work by David Chom and others, that, uh, that was designed to create new forms of value that functioned like money, like cash, in the sense of being uh, anonymous and easily exchangeable but also provided stronger notions of anonymity or, or privacy. Uh, and so early work in that area, uh, and there's a whole interesting story about how that developed and why it didn't sweep the world. Um, early work in that area came together uh, with the cypherpunk beliefs and the desire to have a strong currency that would be decentralized online and relatively private to create the world from which Bitcoin was born as well as the philosophy that many of the early supporters of Bitcoin and, and even many of the supporters today still follow.
Bitcoin began in 2008 with the release of this white paper called Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system uh, that was authored by Satoshi Nakamoto. Uh, this paper, which you can still get online easily, um, is, uh, is the initial description of what Bitcoin is, basically how it works, and what the philosophy behind its design is. Um, and so this is still a good thing to read if you want to get a quick idea of, the, of how the technical design of Bitcoin and how the initial philosophy of its operation uh, was, was specified. So uh, this, was, this was the beginning. This was released along with um, open source software to implement the Bitcoin system back in 2008. And this is where everything started. Now this was written by this person, Satoshi Nakamoto. And Satoshi is one of the uh, central mysteries of Bitcoin. What do we know about Satoshi? Well, Satoshi is the author of this white paper in the original Bitcoin software. The name Satoshi Nakamoto was almost certainly a pseudonym. That is a, a fake name that some person or people have adopted for the purpose of doing, uh, doing things related to Bitcoin. Um, the identity of Satoshi is associated with certain public keys, with certain accounts and certain systems, so that there are certain kinds of um, accounts or statements or certain kinds of digital signatures that would convince the community that something was said by or issued by or created by the real Satoshi. So Satoshi, while being a pseudonym, is also a, a person who can speak and who has spoken uh, especially extensively in the early history of Bitcoin. What do we know about Satoshi? Well, we know that Satoshi writes fairly well in English. Um, Satoshi uses sometimes American, sometimes British spellings. Uh, there's been a lot of attempts to look at the text, to look at the code, and to try to figure out what is Satoshi's native language, where is Satoshi from, attempts to look at the hours and times, and what type of machine does Satoshi use, and all of these sorts of things, try to figure out who is this person or people, and, and what are they doing. Satoshi was fairly active in working on Bitcoin, on writing about Bitcoin, and participating in online forums until around 2010, and since that time, Satoshi has said almost nothing. Uh, there's one notable exception that I'll mention in a minute. Satoshi owns a lot of Bitcoins from early mining. Um, in the beginning, Satoshi was perhaps the only miner or one of the only few people mining Bitcoins. Uh, and those Bitcoins that were accumulated by Satoshi's accounts early on now are extremely valuable. And, and yet those accounts are not being cashed out. Everybody can see which accounts which Bitcoin addresses uh, probably belong to Satoshi. And so if those coins were to be cashed in, if they were to be sold and the proceeds transferred into uh, any particular bank account, that would be a, a, a very notable event and would be an important clue to Satoshi's identity. And so interestingly, although Satoshi created the, uh, uh, the Bitcoin system and has on paper made a lot of profit from it, Satoshi is unable to cash in that profit without identifying him or herself, something that for whatever reason Satoshi doesn't want to do. The real identity of Satoshi, still unknown. The question of who's really Satoshi is a favorite parlor game at Bitcoin-oriented conferences. It's also something that a lot of reporters have tried to do. People have done all sorts of things. They've looked at text, um, the text written by Satoshi, try to compare it to other things. They've tried to look at other pieces of software, to patent applications. They've looked at who was writing papers about things that seemed like technical precursors to Bitcoin before Bitcoin came along et cetera, et cetera. Um, in a, in a well-known incident um, last year, um, a reporter from Newsweek uh, found a guy whose birth name was literally Satoshi Nakamoto and fingered him as the, uh, as the founder of, of Bitcoin, as the Bitcoin Satoshi. That was almost certainly incorrect, as, as, as we have uh, since figured out. Uh, in fact, one of the few times, if any, that Satoshi, that the original real Satoshi has spoken since 2010 was to issue a short statement saying, nope, I'm not that guy. So as of today, and, prob and per probably or perhaps forever, we don't really know who Satoshi is. Uh, and in some sense, it doesn't matter because, um, because of the notable feature of Bitcoin that it is decentralized and with nobody in charge. Satoshi is not in charge. To some extent, it doesn't really matter what Satoshi thinks anymore. Any special influence that Satoshi has is only because of respect that Satoshi would have within the Bitcoin community should Satoshi become active again. So it's possible that we'll never know who Satoshi is. So Bitcoin was started in 2008 by Satoshi, whoever he, she, or they are. 
and um, has grown since then. If we look at a graph of the transaction volume, the number of transactions per day, this starts on the left at the beginning of 2009 and goes up to the summer of 2014. Uh, what you see is something roughly like an exponential growth. Um, and indeed, this is pretty much what you'd expect from something that's spread by word of mouth. Um, like the internet, like other popular technologies, um, Bitcoin has grown um, in a roughly exponential way. And when there are jumps, they typically correspond to bursts of publicity, uh, moments when Bitcoin um, became known in the popular press, for example, or when there were news newsworthy events. Transaction volume has gone up over time. The total value of Bitcoin also has gone up, perhaps in a similar way. Uh, what you see is this looks like zero, but in fact, it's just very low. And you see a relative uh, a rise starting here, maybe beginning in the middle of 2012. This, is, this looks roughly like an exponential growth, but with two spikes superimposed on it. One here in uh, roughly um, April of 2013, March or April of 2013, it spiked up and then relaxed back down to the underlying exponential curve. And then arguably here around the beginning of 2014, it spiked up to uh, about this value and then relaxed back down again to something near the exponential growth which has happened um, since then. So arguably, Bitcoin has grown in a way that is relatively organic and at a relatively constant exponential rate since it was born. Um, and those who believe that Bitcoin has a bright future ahead of it believe that this exponential growth will continue. Thus far in Lecture 7, we've talked about the growth of Bitcoin, we've talked about how Bitcoin operates, who's in charge of it. I want to spend the rest of Lecture 7 talking about governments, governments' interaction with Bitcoin and uh, government attempts to regulate Bitcoin. And we'll start simply with the moment when governments noticed Bitcoin, when Bitcoin became big enough as a phenomenon that governments started to worry about the impact it might have and governments started to talk about how to react to it. One reason why governments um, would notice a digital currency like Bitcoin is that an untraceable digital cash, if it exists, can defeat capital controls. Capital controls are rules or laws that a country has in place that are designed to prevent the flow of, of value, of capital, of wealth, either in or out of the country. And by putting controls on banks and investments and so on, a country can try to prevent these flows. Bitcoin is a very easy way, uh, under some circumstances, to defeat capital controls because someone can simply buy bitcoins with capital inside the country, ship those bitcoins outside the country by electronic means, and then sell those bitcoins for capital or wealth outside the country. Uh, by doing that, they could move capital or wealth from inside to outside, and similarly, you could do the same thing to move it from outside to inside. Because wealth in this electronic form can move so easily across borders and can't really be controlled, a government that wants to enforce capital controls in a world with Bitcoin has to try to disconnect the Bitcoin world from the local fiat currency banking system so that it's not possible for someone to turn large amounts of local currency into Bitcoin or large amounts of Bitcoin into local currency. And so we see countries that are trying to beef up or protect their capital controls do that. And a notable example is China. China has, has engaged in increasingly strong measures to try to disconnect Bitcoins from the Chinese fiat currency banking system. Another reason governments might worry about untraceable digital cash is that it makes certain kinds of crimes easier. Um, in particular, crimes like kidnapping and extortion that involve the payment of a ransom or some kind of a payoff, um, those crimes become easier when payment can be done at a distance and anonymously. Um, law enforcement against kidnappers, for example, often has relied upon uh, exploiting the handoff of money from the victim or the victim's family to the criminals. When that can be done by email, when that can be done at a distance in an anonymous way, it becomes much harder for law enforcement to follow the money. Similarly, tax evasion becomes easier when it's easier for people to move money around, when it's easier to engage in transactions that are not easily tied to a particular individual or identity. Uh, and finally, the sale of illegal items uh, becomes potentially easier when uh, the transfer of funds can happen at a distance and without needing to go through a, a, a regulated institution. A good example of that is Silk Road. 
Silk Road was essentially the eBay for illegal drugs. You can see here a screenshot of Silk Road's website when it was operating. It calls itself an anonymous marketplace. And you can see over on the left some sorts of things that are for sale. Uh, illegal drugs were the primary thing for sale on Silk Road. You can see examples of the sorts of things that were for sale here. Um, Silk Road uh, allowed sellers to, uh, to, to advertise goods for sale. They allowed buyers to buy those goods. The goods were uh, delivered typically by, through the mails or through, uh, uh, through shipment services, and payment was made in, in bitcoins. So Silk Road operated as a Tor hidden service, something that was discussed in an earlier lecture. So by operating as a Tor hidden service, Silk Road, the Silk Road servers could be hidden from law enforcement, so they were difficult for law enforcement to reach. Because Silk Road used Bitcoin for payment, uh, it was also difficult for law enforcement to follow the money and figure out who the uh, people participating in the market were. Silk Road was the largest online market for illegal drugs. Uh, as I said, it ran as a Tor hidden service and used payments in Bitcoin. The site held the Bitcoins in escrow while the goods were shipped. There was an innovative uh, escrow system which helped to protect the buyers and sellers against cheating by, by other parties. The uh, Bitcoins would be released once the, uh, the buyer uh, certified that the goods had arrived. Silk Road had an eBay-like reputation system that allowed buyers and sellers to get reputations for following through on their deals. Um, and by using that reputation system, Silk Road was able to give the participants in the market an incentive to play by the rules, even though they would be very, very difficult to find otherwise. So Silk Road was innovative among criminal markets in finding ways of enforcing the rules of the criminal market um, at a distance, something that criminal markets have in the past had difficulty doing. Silk Road was run by a person who called himself Dread Pirate Roberts, um, and some of you may recognize that reference. Uh, obviously a pseudonym. It operated from February 2011 until October 2013. Silk Road was shut down after the arrest of this guy, Ross Ulbricht, who was um, the alleged operator of Silk Road. He was arrested in October 2013 and he's currently awaiting trial. Uh, the government says that he was the operator of Silk Road and that he tried to cover his tracks by operating using various anonymous accounts, by using Tor, anonymous remailers and those sorts of things, but they said that they were able to connect the dots and connect him to Silk Road activity, to connect him to the servers, and to connect him to the Bitcoins that belonged to the operator of Silk Road. They charged him with various crimes relating to operating Silk Road. They also charged him with attempted murder for hire. Um, it, um, if the allegations are true, he more than once uh, tried to pay to have people killed, Fortunately, he was bad at it and nobody actually got killed, uh, but nonetheless, um, these are some pretty serious charges. The government, in the course of taking down Silk Road, seized about 174,000 bitcoins. That's quite a bit of value. They then auctioned those off to the public. Um, as with the proceeds of any crime under US law, they could be uh, seized by the government and the government did, did seize them. So Mr. Albrecht is awaiting trial. We'll eventually um, perhaps find out um, the full evidence uh, against him. Now there are several lessons from Silk Road and from the uh, encounter between law enforcement on the one hand and um, Dread Pirate Roberts, perhaps Mr. Albrecht on the other hand. First of all, one, one lesson is that it's actually pretty hard to keep the real world and the virtual world separate. Um, the operator of Silk Road believed that he could live his real life, um, living in society, and at the same time have a secret identity in which he operated a fairly good sized business um, and technology infrastructure um, that apparently is harder than you would think. It's difficult to keep these separate worlds completely apart and not accidentally create some linkage between them. It's hard to stay anonymous for a long time. It's hard to be very active and engage in a course of coordinated conduct in which you're working with other people over time uh, while remaining anonymous. The reason being that although you can operate multiple identities, if there's ever a connection between two of those identities, if you ever slip up and use the name of one while wearing the mask of another, or if you ever slip up and create a link between them, that link can never be destroyed. And over time, the different anonymous or uh, identities or masks that someone is trying to use tend to get connected, and there's a lesson there as well. The third lesson here is that the feds, the, the law enforcement, can follow the money. 
Because even before there was an arrest in the Silk Road case, the government knew that certain Bitcoin addresses were operated by the operator of Silk Road, and they were watching those addresses. The result is that the operator of Silk Road, while wealthy in, according to the blockchain, was not actually able to benefit from that wealth because any attempt to transfer those assets over into the dollar world uh, would have resulted in a traceable event and probably would have, would have resulted in rapid arrest. And so although Mr. Albrecht was allegedly the owner of 174,000 bitcoins, the fact is he was not living like a king. He was living in a one bedroom apartment in San Francisco, apparently unable to get to the wealth that he allegedly controlled. The lessons here are that um, if you intend to operate an underground criminal enterprise, and I hope you as our students are not, but if you are, that it's a lot harder to do than you might think. That the uh, technologies like Bitcoin and Tor are not panaceas for people who want to do these things, and that law enforcement actually has some pretty significant tools that they can still use. And so although there might have been some panic in the world of law enforcement over the rise of Bitcoin, law enforcement is more and more realizing that they can still follow the money up to a point and that they still do have a su substantial ability to investigate crimes and to make life difficult for people who want to engage in coordinated criminal action. In section 7.6, we'll talk about anti-money laundering. Uh, what is money laundering and what are the rules that governments have imposed, uh, especially in the U.S., that affect uh, Bitcoin, some Bitcoin-related businesses? So the goal of anti-money laundering policy is to prevent large flows of money from crossing borders or moving between the underground and legitimate economy without being detected. I talked earlier about capital controls where countries are just trying to prevent money from crossing borders. In some cases, countries are just fine with money crossing borders, but they want to know who's transferring what to whom and where that money came from. Uh, Anti-money laundering is aimed at trying to make certain kinds of crime more difficult, especially organized crime. Uh, organized crime groups often find themselves um, getting a lot of money coming in in one place and wanting to ship it to somewhere else, but not wanting to explain where that money come, came from, hence the desire to get money across borders. Or they find themselves making a lot of money in an underground economy and wanting to get that money into the above ground legitimate economy so that they can spend it on on sports cars and big houses or whatever it is that the, the leaders of the group want to do. Anti-money laundering is designed to make that more difficult, to either try to catch people trying to do those things or else prevent them from doing it uh, in order to uh, detect certain kinds of crimes or make organized crime more difficult. One of the rules that goes with anti-money laundering is something called know your customer, sometimes called KYC. Uh, and the details of this can be a little bit complicated, depend on your locale, but the basic idea is this, that know your customer rules uh, require certain kinds of uh, businesses that handle money to first of all identify and authenticate who their clients are, to know who these people are and to get some kind of authentication that they really are, who they claim they are and that those claimed identities correspond to some kind of identity in the real world. So a person just can't, can't just walk in and say, I'm John Smith from 123 Main Street in any town USA. They have to actually give an identity and have that be checked in order to engage in certain kinds of business. Second, after identifying and authenticating the clients, the, uh, the business may be required to evaluate how risky it is, what the risk is with respect to a certain client engaging in underground activities. And this will be based on how the client behaves, how, how long-standing their business relationship is with the company, how well known they are in the community and various other kinds of factors. But know your customer rules generally re would require some kind of risk analysis with respect to individual clients and would, and would require uh, a, a company that's covered by KYC to treat clients whose activities seem riskier with more attention. And then finally, third, typically there's a requirement to watch for anomalous behavior, to watch for behavior that seems to be indicative of criminal activity or of money laundering or of other sorts of things, tying that together with the, with the risk evaluation to understand what's the level of risk with respect to a particular customer and how to, what to watch for with respect to a particular customer. KYC will often ask a company to cut off business with a client who looks too dodgy or who's unable to uh, authenticate themselves or them, their activities 
sufficiently uh, for the rule. As I said, uh, this gets complicated, but this is the basic outline. Uh, there are mandatory reporting requirements in the United States that are worth talking about. For example, companies uh, in, a, in a broad range of sectors have to report currency transactions that are over $10,000. They have to file something called the currency transaction report to say what is the transaction, who is the, who is the other party to the transaction, um, and there's some requirement to authenticate who they are. This has to be reported to the government and that goes into databases and then might be analyzed to look for patterns of behavior that are indicative of money laundering. Um, companies are also required to watch for clients who are engaged in what's called structuring. That is in structuring transactions to avoid reporting. For example, if someone engages in a series of transactions that are $9,000 in value as a way to get around the $10,000 transaction reporting rule, uh, that amounts to structuring. It looks like an attempt to evade the reporting requirements and a company that sees structuring is required to report it and they're required to watch for it. Uh, and so that requires filing of a suspicious activity report. Again, uh, filing that with, uh, with the US government and that again goes into a database, might lead to investigation of the client. The requirements here differ by country. I am by no means trying to give you legal advice about whether you need this or what you have to do. I just want to give an idea of what kind of requirements are imposed by, by, by anti-money laundering rules. But I do want everyone to note that government, the US government and other governments take anti-money laundering rules very, very seriously. This is not the kind of rule you can just blow off and deal with it if you get a complaint from the government later. Bitcoin businesses have been shut down. They've been shut down temporarily. They've been shut down permanently. Business people have been arrested. People have gone to jail for not following these rules. Um, this is one of those areas where government will enforce the law vigorously and where uh, if you're interested in going into any kind of a business that is handling certainly large transactions or uh, for sure um, currency or, or fiat currency value in, uh, in quantity, you had better be talking to a lawyer who understands these rules. Uh, this is an area in which government absolutely does regulate Bitcoin and has ever since they noticed that Bitcoin was large enough to, uh, to pose a risk of money laundering. In section 7.7, .7, I want to talk about the R word, regulation. Now, regulation often gets a bad name, and it especially has a bad name among the kind of people who tend to like Bitcoin. Uh, regulation is some bureaucrat who doesn't know my business or what I'm trying to do coming in and messing things up. It's a burden, it's stupid, it's pointless, etc. Now those arguments often are correct, um, but I want to talk in a little more detail in this section about reasons why regulation might sometimes be justified. The argument against regulation is pretty common, it's pretty well understood, I'm not going to repeat it here. Uh, and so you'll hear me talking mostly about what reasons why regulation might be a good idea, because that argument is not as well understood and I want to lay it out here a little bit. Um, but just to be clear, the fact that I'm spending most of this section talking about why regulation might be good shouldn't be read as an endorsement that of, of widespread regulation or as a feeling that regulation is the greatest thing ever. It's simply that I want to bring a little bit more balance to the discussion um, in a community where regulation is often considered as always bad or just um, stupid by nature. All right. So the bottom line argument in favor of regulation is just this, that when markets fail and produce outcomes that are bad and often agree to be bad by pretty much everyone in the market, then regulation can step in and try to address the failure. So the argument for regulation, when there is an argument, starts with the idea that markets don't always give you the result that, that you'd like. So let me give you an example of a way in which the market can fail, and this is a, a classic example called the lemons market which uh, originated in a discussion about used cars. So well, let's talk about a market in, in concept, a market for widgets, some kind of good that we want to sell. And let's say that widgets can be either low quality widgets or high quality widgets. A high quality widget costs a little bit more to manufacture than a low quality widget, but it's much, much better for the consumer who buys it. Consumers like high quality widgets much, much better. Now an efficient market, a market that's operating well, would therefore deliver mostly high quality, or I'll write it HQ, widgets to consumers. Why? 
because the price of the high quality widget will be just a little bit higher, but the widget will be so much better that almost everyone will buy the high quality widgets. And so this is what you would hope that a market would provide, and under certain assumptions, a market will provide that. But let's suppose that customers, for some reason, can't tell a high quality widget apart from a low quality widget. What if they really can't tell which widgets are good and which widgets are not? Think of a used car from the classic example. You're looking at a used car sitting on the lot. Well, gee, it looks pretty good, but you can't really tell if it's going to break down tomorrow or if it's going to run for a long time. The dealer probably knows if it's a lemon, but you as the customer can't tell the difference. So you can't tell high quality from low quality. So if you think about what happens, where incentives drive people in this kind of lemons market, you can see that as a, as a consumer, you're not willing to pay extra for a high quality widget. Why? Because you can't tell the difference. And so if the used car dealer says, sure, this one is perfect, it's not a lemon at all, go ahead and buy it. It's only an extra $100. Well, it might be that you'd happily pay $100 for a higher quality car, but you don't really know whether that car, whether that widget really is high quality. So if you really can't tell which widgets are high quality versus low quality, then you're not willing to pay extra for, uh, for the high quality one. And if consumers are not willing to pay extra for a high quality one, then producers can't make any extra money by selling a high quality widget. In fact, they lose money by selling a high quality widget. Uh, because uh, they don't get any price premium. They'd be better off buying the slightly cheaper low quality widget and selling it. And so the result is if consumers really can't tell which, which widgets are high quality and which are low quality, the market gets stuck in an equilibrium where only low quality widgets are produced um, and, uh, and consumers are relatively unhappy with them. Now this outcome is worse for everybody than a properly functioning market would be. It's worse for buyers because they have to make do with low quality widgets when in a more efficient market they could have bought a widget that was much, much better for only a little bit higher price. It's also worse for producers because, because the widgets that are on the market are all lousy, consumers don't buy very many widgets. The widget market is relatively small and so there's less money to be made selling widgets than there would be in a healthy market. And so both consumers and producers are worse off in a world where consumers can't tell the difference between high quality and low quality widgets. That's a market failure. It's called an asymmetric information failure. And the result is a market that's sometimes called the lemons market. Okay, so how can we fix this? Well, there are some market-based approaches that try to fix a lemons market. The first market-based approach relies on the seller's reputation. The idea is that if a seller um, tells the truth to consumers about which widgets are high quality and which are low quality, then the seller might get a reputation for telling the truth. And once they have that reputation, then maybe they can sell high quality widgets for a higher price because consumers will believe them. Uh, and therefore, the market can operate more efficiently. The problem with this is, yes, this sometimes works, but sometimes it doesn't, depending on the precise assumptions you make about the market. Uh, but if you think about it, this is not going to work as well uh, as a market where consumers can really tell the difference. Because for one thing, uh, it takes a while for a producer to build up a, a good reputation. In order to build up a good reputation, they have to sell high quality widgets at low prices for a while until consumers learn that that seller is telling the truth. And that makes it harder for an honest seller to get into the market. The other problem that can occur is that that seller, uh, even if they've been honest up to now, if for one reason or another their sales are shrinking or they think they want to get out of the market, their incentive is to massively cheat people all at once and then leave the market rather than continuing to be honest and then leave the market. And so in the beginning of a seller's presence in the market and at the end of a seller's presence in the market, reputation tends not to work. This sort of reputation-based approach also tends not to work in businesses where uh, where consumers don't do repeat business with the same entity or where the product category is very new. Uh, and so there hasn't been enough time for sellers to build up a reputation, like say in a high tech market, like say Bitcoin exchanges. The other market-based approach is warranties. That's the idea that a seller could provide a warranty to a buyer that says that if this thing turns out to be low quality, if it doesn't work well for you, I'll give you a new one, I'll pay you, I'll pay you back, or, or something like that. Uh, and that can work up to a point as well, but there's also a problem there, that this warranty is just another kind of product 
which could also come in high quality and low quality versions. A low quality warranty is one where the seller doesn't really come through when you come back with a broken product. They don't really replace it. They don't really give you their, your money. They make you jump through all kinds of hoops. And so this is not a panacea either. So if you have a lemons market which has developed, and if these market-based approaches don't work for the particular market that you're dealing with, then regulation might be able to, to, to help. And there are three ways in which regulation might be able to help address a lemons market. First, uh, regulation could require disclosure. They could require, say, that all widgets be labeled as high quality or low quality, and then have penalties on the firms for lying. That gives consumers the information that they were missing. A second approach to regulation is to have quality standards, is to require that no widget can be sold unless it meets some standard of quality testing, and have that standard set so that only high quality widgets can pass the test. That way you have a market that's all one kind of widget, but at least it's high quality widgets, assuming that the regulation works as intended. Or you could have required warranties so that all sellers have to issue warranties and then require, then enforce the, uh, the operation of those warranties so that sellers are really held to the promises that they make. So all of these are forms of regulation which obviously could fail, which might not work as intended, which might be miswritten or misapplied, they might be burdensome on sellers and so on, but there's at least the possibility that regulation of this type might help to address um, the market failure due to a lemons market. So this is one example of how regulation can be an efficient thing to do if it's done well when there's a certain kind of problem, namely the, ability, the inability of consumers to tell the difference between a high quality and a low quality product offering. And so people who talk about Bitcoin exchanges, for example, and argue for regulation of them sometimes point to them as an example of lemons market. Another example um, of a market failure or a place where the market doesn't operate the way that, uh, that you would like it to in order to, serve, in order to serve consumers is price fixing. Price fixing simply is a case where different people are selling a product in a market and they just agree with each other that we're going to raise prices or we're not going to lower prices. Related to price fixing is an agreement not to compete where companies that would otherwise go into competition with each other agree not to compete with each other. For example, if there were two bakeries in town, they might agree that one of them will only sell muffins and the other will only sell bagels. And that way there's less competition between them than there would be if they both sold muffins and bagels. Um, as a result of the reduced competition, presumably prices go up and the merchants are able to, uh, to, to foil the operation of the market. Because after all, the reason that the market protects consumers well in its normal operation is through the vehicle of competition, that sellers have to compete uh, in order to offer the best goods at the best price to consumers, and if they don't compete in that way, then they won't get business. So an agreement to fix prices or an agreement not to compete circumvents that competition and prevents competition from operating in the market. So another way that the market can fail is when people take steps that prevent competition. These, these kinds of agreements, either an agreement to raise prices or an agreement not to compete, these are illegal in most jurisdictions. This is part of antitrust law or competition law. In general, antitrust or competition law is aimed to prevent cases where uh, the market gets stuck in, in a situation where there isn't enough competition to protect consumers um, or cases where somebody acts in a deliberate way to try to prevent someone from competing with them, uh, acting in a way other than simply offering good products at good prices. Antitrust law is very complicated. I've given you sort of a sketch of it, but this is another instance where we know that there are failures that can occur and where the law will step in to prevent, in the easy cases, things like price fixing or agreement not to compete, but in more difficult cases, uh, even some attempts to reduce competition in the market through, say, mergers uh, or other kinds of activity another example where regulation might be helpful. In section 7.8, I want to talk about New York State's bit license proposal. I've talked so far about regulation in general. I've talked about a few forms of regulation. I've talked in general about why regulation might be justified in some cases, why it might make good economic sense. Um, but now I want to talk about a specific effort by a specific state to uh, introduce specific regulation of Bitcoin. We'll dig a little bit into what the bit license proposal would do 
This is an issue that is current as of the filming of this lecture, that'll be current as of the release of this lecture. And, um, uh, and it gives you a snapshot of the kinds of things that uh, regulators are doing. Okay, so the bit license proposal was issued in July of 2014. Down at the bottom of the slide here, there's a URL where you can go and read it if you like. Here's the heading on it, the New York State Department of Financial Services. That's the part of the state of New York that regulates the financial industry. And of course, the state of New York has the world's largest center of the financial industry in it. And so uh, it's a part of the New York State government that is, uh, is used to dealing with relatively large institutions. It's a proposed set of codes, rules, and regulations um, that has to do with virtual currencies. So this is a new regulatory proposal from the state of New York. And uh, this is, there's a lot of text here, but let's walk through it. It's worth talking about. Uh, what the regulation fundamentally says is that you would need to get something called a bit license from the New York Department of Financial Services if you wanted to do any of the things listed on this slide. If you wanted to engage in virtual currency business activity, that means any one of the following things if you're dealing with New York or a New York resident. So if you're doing any one of these five things and any of your customers are in New York, and perhaps um, consult your lawyer, if you have business partners or other aspects of your business in New York relating to this, you need a bit license. The first thing is receiving virtual currency for transmission or transmitting virtual currency. Second, securing, storing, holding, or maintaining custody or control of virtual currency on behalf of others. This might cover something like wallet services or other sorts of things, um, or perhaps exchanges. Buying and selling virtual currency as a customer business. You can apparently buy and sell it for yourself, but doing it as a customer business, you need a bit license. Performing retail conversion services, including conversion or exchange of fiat currency or other value into virtual currency, conversion or exchange of virtual currency into fiat currency, or the conversion or exchange of one form of virtual currency into another form of virtual currency. So if you're trading virtual currency for fiat currency or virtual currency for virtual currency. And finally, controlling, administering, or issuing a virtual currency. If you're doing any one of those things in the state of New York or, uh, or, or operating with a New York state resident, then you need to get a bit license from the New York De Department of Financial Services if this regulation goes into effect. Uh, you would have to apply for a license. To apply for a license, there's detailed language in the proposed regulation, which you can read, but roughly speaking, you have to provide information on the ownership of your enterprise, on your finances and insurance, on your business plan, generally to allow the Department of Financial Services to know who you are, how well backed you are, where your money comes from, and what you're planning to do. You have to pay an application fee. You would have to pay. Uh, a licensee would have to do the following things once you had a license. You'd have to provide updated information to the Department of Financial Services about the things I talked about before, ownership, finances, insurance, and so on. You'd have to provide periodic financial statements so they can keep track of how you're doing financially. You'd be required to maintain a financial reserve. The amount of that would be set by the Division of Fi Department of Financial Services based on um, various factors about your business, what's the nature of your business, how well financed it is, who it is, how big it is, et cetera, et cetera the DFS would be able to set rules about that. Uh, there are detailed rules about things like how, do, how you would keep custody of consumer assets. There are anti-money laundering rules which might or might not go beyond what's already required. There are rules related to cybersecurity, having a cybersecurity plan and penetration testing and so on. There are rules about disaster recovery. You have to have a disaster recovery plan and that meets various certain criteria. There are rules about record keeping. You have to keep records and make them available to the DFS on certain circumstances for some length of time about certain kinds of activities. You have to designate a compliance officer, someone within your company, your organization, who is in charge of compliance and has responsibility and authority to make compliance happen. You have to have written policies about compliance and about certain kinds of things that are satisfactory to the NYDFS. And there's a requirement that you disclose risks to consumers so that consumers understand what are the risks of doing business with you. Uh, the exact rules on that are not exactly clear at this point, but you might imagine something like, uh, like the sort of prospectus that comes along with a mutual fund or with, or, or with a publicly traded stock. Perhaps that's what the DFS has in mind. Uh, so these are um, fairly substantial requirements for companies 
that, that have a bit license. And anyone with a bit license would be required to do all this stuff. The state of the bit license proposal right now, the situation that it's in um, as of this filming, which is August 2014, um, is it has been proposed by the New York Department of Financial Services. It's been formally proposed. You can go read the document, the, the proposal um, at the URL that was on the earlier slide. The, the DFS has solicited public comments. They have asked members of the public to write in and give them comments about the proposal. Do you like it? Do you not like it? What's good? What's bad? What do you propose changed? And so on. And lots and lots of entities are gearing up to send comments to the NYDFS. After all the comments are in, in accordance with the normal regulatory process, the NYDFS will decide what to do. They'll decide whether to withdraw the proposed regulation, whether to issue it in modified form, whether to issue it in exactly the original form, uh, and along with that decision, they'll issue some kind of a document that gives the rationale for deciding what they decided to do. Um, now, various parties have asked the NYDFS to grant an extension on the original date for, uh, for comments, um, and NYDFS has signaled, they haven't definitively stated, but it seems pretty clear at this point that they're going to grant an extension. Because of that, I don't currently know the date. I can't tell you the date by which you have to comment but you can go and look at the NYDFS website uh, to, get, uh, to get the current status. Um, if you're an interested party, by, by all means, I would encourage you to comment. Um, I would encourage you to get together with others and comment together. Uh, and I would advise you to make comments which are thoughtful and constructive and give the NYDFS reasoned arguments, uh, comments of the sort of, this is the coolest thing ever, or you guys are total idiots, you don't know what you're doing, uh, might make you feel good, but they're not going to affect what the NYDFS does. My prediction at the end of the day is that some kind of bit license is likely to, to be put in place by the NYDFS. Um, maybe, maybe it will be reduced from the scope or changed from what was originally proposed, but some kind of bit license, that call, some kind of licensing um, regime which calls itself bit license, I predict, will be put in place by the New York Department of Financial Services. If this happens or if New York doesn't do it and somebody else does something similar, uh, the result will be that if you want to do business in any of the business sectors that uh, we talked about in the previous slide, you would need a bit license uh, from the state of New York in order to operate. Uh, and if this goes into effect, this would really be an, a major step in the history of Bitcoin. You would have a situation where not only NYDFS, but perhaps other jurisdictions would start to step in and regulate, and you'd start to see Bitcoin businesses get closer to the model of regulated financial institutions that traditional financial institutions have been in. This would be a step that really is in some ways contrary to some of the initial uh, cypherpunk or cyber libertarian ideas about what Bitcoin was supposed to be. Uh, and, but in a very real sense, I think it's inevitable that as soon as Bitcoin became really valuable, that Bitcoin businesses became big businesses, that government got interested, it was more or less inevitable that regulation would ensue. Because Bitcoin businesses touch real people, because they, they touch the fiat currency economy, because Bitcoin is big enough to matter, government is paying attention and Bitcoin is getting regulated. This on the one hand um, represents a retreat from what the original advocates of Bitcoin had in mind. Uh, in another way, it represents the Bitcoin ecosystem growing up and integrating into the, uh, into the, uh, the regular economy, which is much more regulated. Uh, regardless of whether you like it or don't like it, this is a thing that's starting to happen. And if you're interested in starting a business in this area, uh, you need to be paying attention to this trend. Will this be a success? Will it be good or bad? Well, I think there's one barometer we can look to to understand whether a regulation like the bit license is actually successful from a public policy standpoint at improving the quality of Bitcoin businesses. And that's this. If something like bit license goes into effect, and if companies start advertising to customers outside New York that we have a bit license, therefore you can trust us. And if that argument that we're regulated, therefore you can trust us is convincing to consumers, if consumers see regulation as a positive in choosing a company, then I think the regulation will be working in the way that its advocates wanted it to do. Whether that will happen and how this affects the future of Bitcoin is something that we'll have to wait and see.